Hello there, this is an update video regarding the Motorola um, R2001D radio communications test set. Um, this particular video is a re-upload of the original because it's now been repaired. Um, this particular test set um, repair video is about an hour and a half long. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Um, it's certainly been a challenge as this test set to repair. I've had numerous faults to fix on it, including the cathode ray tube not working properly, uh, dry joints riddled throughout it, and as you'll see in the video, this test set when it came to me uh, from a friend who was a radio amateur who bought this and it didn't work for him. I had numerous faults on it, it didn't do anything when he powered it up. Um, but anyway, um, we'll get on with the video. Uh, obviously towards the end is the fix for the cathode ray tube, if you want to look at that if you're interested because it is a common fault on these by all counts and uh, obviously from the beginning of the video to the middle part of the video we do a lot of fault finding um, we do a lot of circuit reading uh, looking at the theory of operation and obviously delving deeper into uh, into trying to deal with faults in an instrument where if you haven't got the extender boards to raise the cards out the test set which you're meant to have when doing service repair and alignments uh, then it can be challenging as, as this one was and then we do adjustments and alignments at the end as well and conformance testing so please um, like and subscribe to the uh, the channel um, by all means leave comments in the video below um, obviously a word of warning for anybody wanting to work on these test sets um, I have put a warning at the end of the video with the lid off to show the high voltage areas within the unit uh, these test sets can kill you, uh, without a doubt, if you're working on them and you don't know what you're doing. There are several locations inside which I'll go into in the video, uh, with uh, a 5000 volt supply for the cathode ray tube on the anode. The cathode runs at about 2500 volts, minus 2500 volts. The switch mode power supply inside has over 400 volts present on it. Uh, DC, after rectification of the mains, again if you've got the lids off these things and you're working on it if you were to uh, even with an isolation transformer on the bench come into contact with those voltages it is half a day with the undertaker so bear that in mind uh, you work on these at your own risk and they're extremely dangerous to work on so you know with that um, please bear that in mind uh, exercise electrical safety and uh, build your knowledge up first before you whip the lid off and start tinkering inside but with that, um, I'll let you watch the video, and by all means, please let me know what you think in the comments. Thank you, bye-bye. Hello there, thank you for joining me again today on a repair video of a Motorola radio communications test set. Um, this particular model is a Motorola um, R2001D communication systems analyzer. Um, this came from a radio amateur friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, um, who's had this radio test set for a number of years, I believe, and um, picked it up at some point in the past, and uh, has um, noted that I think there was an issue with it. Um, he did say that he took the cards out the top and uh, put them back in again, and then it didn't work again after that. Um, so anyway... Um, this is a repair video of this radio communications test set. It's not many of these that I've uh, come across over the years that needed repair. They're normally very reliable and quite good. Been around for a very long time um, and I've seen them about. This one in particular is in very good condition. Um, just before we switch it on and show you what the fault is. But the case and everything, a lot of them that I've seen have been battered to hell and uh, although they're like 30 40 years old um some of them especially the older models that came before this um but even this type of uh, model of test set i've seen with other radio ams over the years and the case has been terribly damaged and there's been other things wrong as well cosmetically but this test set's in very good condition for its age and um, remarkably well looked after whoever's on this prior to uh, my friend and indeed my my friend who now owns this has looked after it as well. Just a bit dusty, you can sort of write your name on the display so we'll give it a clean as well. Um, so we'll just show you what the fault is first before we start getting into the uh, the repair video. 
and uh, so we'll switch it on we've got the mains connected at the moment it's in standby mode there we've got the the power switch there you've got three modes DC off standby and then on so we've got the AC light on which means that we've got power fed on the IEC jack at the back so we'll click it to on and that's basically what we've got just a constant noise and uh, Some weird thing. Now, my friend was asking me if EHT um, works on this, and obviously, uh, when it's been on a while, we can see down here that we're getting a, uh, a luminance, which is caused through obviously the um, electron gun striking on the on the phosphor, and uh, we're actually getting an EHT. Must be getting EHT supply to the tube because obviously this illumination here so I think it's just scanning vertically but just fixed at the end of a tube so it's, it's way off so I think the HT is working but no other controls work or anything there's no sign of any operation or anything like that so it looks to me like and we just saw there the little spot came on I'm not sure if that's on the video but you can just see a little little spot there so we must be getting the HT uh, on the tube as well which is what he asked um, but yeah so this this particular uh, radio test set uh, needs some attention now what I've done I've uh, removed the screws on the on the top so we can have a look in inside as the next uh, part of call and uh, we've got some information on the uh, on the lid here which I'm going to be reading as well we'll have a look at that and then uh, that's a look inside so he's had those cards out there apparently so we're going to look at those we're going to get those out we're going to have a look at the edge connectors and other things we're going to measure the power supply rails as well because I've got a sneaky suspicion that it could also be a, a power supply issue it's a good place to start with any electronic equipment repair is a power supply section and we'll see if we can get the um, service manual downloaded, schematic diagrams, things like that for your operation. So we can start to uh, do some repairs. So we'll come back to you very shortly. Okay, uh, we've uh, now got into it a bit further. We've uh, downloaded the service manual, etc. Um, the power supply section is at the back here. That's under a separate cover, which we've removed. Uh, which are these boards? We've got the processor board at the end here, which runs on a 6800 microprocessor base system. Uh, looks like some kind of an option board there with some jumpers on it. Uh, these look like the analog boards then for the rest of the measurement side of the instrument. RF section, synthesizer section, and then obviously the um, EHT supply for the anode for the... Uh, monitor the cathode ray tube and obviously there's a VDU display board here and um, I've just been reading the service manual as well which is uh, downloaded now and we've got um, a couple of supplies which uh, I think are measured on the uh, the test points there's uh, these here I think these are the test points with the supply which we're going to verify in the manual but basically uh, there's a plus 5 volt rail, a plus 12 volt rail, a minus 12 volt rail, a minus 5 volt rail, a plus 33 volt rail and a plus 110. Um, so we'll measure those on the test points. Normally the plus and minus 5 and plus and minus 12 volt rails are for the logic and analog boards and synthesise an RS section. The plus 33 and plus 110 normally tend to be used for driving the CRT and uh, video display board so but we'll check that in the service manual just to make sure but that generally is the case on most other equipments that I've come across um, now with it just emitting a constant tone and um, it seems to be like it there's no VDU representation from the logic board you know the process is obviously not running for two reasons one because none of the controls work when the test sets powered up the LEDs that illuminate are locked in that state 
they're not changing when you obviously try and change the function here so that that to me looks like as if either the process is not running or there's some issue with the microcontroller not registering the user inputs likewise the vdu graphics the um, graphical user interface which is um, run by the microprocessor again gives out uh, graphical um, information which needs to be displayed on the display that's not getting to the vdu board because it's not scanning horizontally and it's just in a, a in a vertical scan top to bottom in the far left of the display that seems to indicate to me as well that there's an issue with the processor not supplying uh, text information to be displayed on the on the crt none of the controls seem to work apart from the volume controls where you can turn the volume up and down and listen to white noise which is coming from the receiver so it may indicate that the rs sections are working and powered up but obviously there's no um, microcontroller function so i'm going to start where most people start in in these kind of scenarios where start with a power supply and then work forward from there rather than just go straight into looking at faults on the vdu boards and the processor boards and RS. so no point in doing any of that until we've verified that the power supply section um in in here is you know is operating i've had a quick um scan of those capacitors down they haven't pulled the boards yet which i'm going to do next but i think the very first thing to do before we go any further is just to measure the voltage on these test points see if we've got those supply rails there and then uh, if we have them we can progress from there um, then I'll pull the boards and check the physical condition of the circuit boards, make sure there's no burn components, do a visual inspection of the capacitors to make sure they're not bowed up at the end or gassed off, that kind of thing, or um, we can also do ESR checks if necessary. But uh, I'll just establish if the power supply rails are working first, and then we'll go from there. And uh, potentially there could be a short circuit on one of the boards, because not it is coming out with a, like an alarm tone, um, it's a constant high pitched tone around about 3 kilohertz in frequency and I'm wondering, I haven't read the manual fully yet, if that's some kind of an error tone or if it detects its own internal system failure that it creates some kind of a, a warning notification by a, an audible tone or it could just be a fluke of the fault as well so uh, we'll have a look at that because potentially it could be that uh, one of the boards is, um, you know shorting out the power supply for example and it's uh, alarming for that reason um, so we don't know that information yet so I think the first starting point measure the voltages on the test points see what we get out of it and then um, we can go from there back shortly okay so reading the service manual um, sounds like as if uh, board A um, a3 here is a battery charger board, A4 is a control board, um, these are the different supply boards as well but reading the service manual it says that um, basically it says the secondary winding outputs of the chopping transformer are all full wave centre tap rectified. Each of these outputs is filtered by an LC low pass filter. The output voltages are listed in table 8.2. These voltages are specified when the plus 5 volt output is adjusted for 5.2 volts plus or minus 1%. It says this adjustment is located on R6 on the control board A4. The plus 33 volt and minus 5 volt outputs are protected against over voltage by this board's Zener diodes VR1 and VR2. The plus 5 volt output is protected against over voltage by a Zener diode VR3 on the battery charger board A3. The plus 12 volt and minus 12 volt outputs are protected against over voltage by comparator U7 on the control board which shuts down the power supply when it detects an over voltage. So then we've got a table there with all the uh, voltages and uh, obviously um, on the schematic diagram as well which we've uh, been looking at uh, we've, we've then got the uh, test point references as well um, which are just there in that uh, that section there just uh, just here so we'll measure those now and see where they are so they 
they appear to be on the control board um, or on the uh, the output. And I'm just trying to find out which one of these boards is the actual. Cause it's not very explanatory in the uh, in the in the service manual, but uh, that's the battery charger board there. Um, this is a control board. That I think is the actual power supply board along with these two. I think one's a higher voltage supply and the other's a lower voltage. Although I'll check that in the manual. Um, just drawing common parallels, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, six voltage outputs. And I've noticed that uh, we've got two, four, six um, on there, whereas we've got more test points. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to correlate. It could be that, you know, it's on this board, but um, I'll just see if I can dig further in the, in the manual. I think that's R6 there for setting the... 5 volt output the 5.1 volt output so we'll just check that in the in the service manual before we do anything else I'll just start measuring voltages then and see what we uh, what we get okay sorry about the noise but just in the process of uh, powering the test set up now to do the voltage measurements I've noticed the display um, is seems to be doing something now which it wasn't doing before which just shows the intermittent nature of the fault but likewise pressing these buttons does nothing, it doesn't change the uh, the LEDs you know, there's no operation at all no matter what control you do or what button you press on here it does nothing um, it does seem like a power supply fault to me to be honest although you know obviously we don't know for certain yet but the RF attenuator etc and none of the controls no matter what you turn adjust nothing changes you know just a bit of noise there on that pot but no so anyway so uh, at least the HT is running on the CRT etc um, but there's no no other operation I'm afraid so we'll, uh, we'll measure the supply voltages Okay, so this is the power supply board that's been extracted just before we do any test and measurement. So we're just looking for any obvious signs of blow, you know, board capacitors or where they've gassed off. Um, any leakage underneath on the circuit board, you know, where the capacitors stand. To see whether any of them have leaked or whatever, but there doesn't seem to be any uh, any sign of that. There's a date called there, 1984. So that just shows you uh, how long ago this test set was made. Um, everything all looks okay, to be honest, on the board. I think it's just a case of measuring uh, these test points now, which um, were different to what I thought previously on the other board. This is the, the board where all the test points are for the supply rails, because um, this is obviously one of the main power supplies. Um, so we'll have a look at the other boards as well, we'll get those out one by one and check those before we do any measurements just to see if there's anything obvious. Okay, we're back. Uh, just before we switch on the test set, um, I've checked these boards, the condition of them, they all look fine, there's no board capacitors, leaking caps or anything like that, so I'm happy now to do voltage measurements. Unfortunately, uh, I can't stop the speaker from making a racket because it's connected down there and I can't get to the connections on the speaker because the soldered on and it's below that tube also the cable for that speaker goes through into a tray beneath which is enclosed in a screening cam so I can't disconnect the speaker unfortunately and I can't get it out easily so we're gonna to have to put up with the sound from the speaker I'm afraid while we just do this measurement on the uh, multimeter so just to explain what we're going to do, we're going to measure the voltages on the test points as per what was in the schematic diagram. Um, we, we are also going to measure any ripple that's on the supply as well to see if there's any AC noise on there which would indicate bad uh, reservoir capacitors uh, that have dried up etc. So we're going to look at that and then we're going to go forward from there. So that's the first thing we're going to do. So we'll switch it on. I've got my uh, ground of my probe connected to the chassis which is where in the manual it says that the uh, zero volt connection is and then uh, we're on DC volts on here um, 
yeah we're on DC volts there so uh, volts DC so we will uh, enter on that one and uh, we'll just wait and see now I touched the probe with my fingers yeah just an auto range so right we'll switch it on and then we'll go onto this test point here uh, let's have a look so that's the minus 12 volt rail it's running at minus 11.69 volts um, so the next one will be uh, minus 12 so it's funny that it's not a lot is it two minus 12 volt rails yeah. is it minus sorry what am I saying here? You know, when I read my voltages right into it. So that's uh, minus 116 volts, 117 volts. And then this next connection there is minus 12. And then the next connection there is plus 5.2 volts. Um, that next connection minus 5 volts and then we've got another connection there plus 12 volts uh, next connection plus 32 volts and then the last one is plus 115 volts so it looks just switch it off it looks as if the power supply is functioning that's definitely the case with the look of it. The supply rails are leaving the power supply there on those test points. So I think what I'm going to do next, uh, now that we've established the power supply seems to be functioning, um, I'll just have a look at the uh, series pass regulator board. We've got a board at the top here which has got some... Uh, Motorola transistors, power transistors, bolted to them, TO3 style. Just interested to see uh, what that board does there and uh, and see what supply is on that. Let's just measure there. Right, so we've got not much on there. Let's have a look next one. That's these are AC. Yeah, probably are. Looks like they're the. Um, that's probably the, the switching one. But what we'll do, we'll change this now to uh, AC, and then we'll just go back onto onto these to check to see whether there's any any ripple on them. So I'll do them one by one. And then we'll see what's what. Sorry about the noise in the background, but uh, so we can see on the uh, display there we've got the AC reading at the top and the DC reading just below it. And as, as I change to different, uh, you can read the DC volts and the smaller digits. And so there's no ripple on there. There's no. AC component so that tells me uh, that tells me that's alright so that's while it's still on AC the meter let's just go on to this top board so we can measure any DC with that let's have a look yeah we've got uh, what looks to be uh, hmm that's strange it's knocking on that first test point Nothing on there, or there, 2.6 volts, another 2.5 volts, 4.26 volt AC, hmm, right, I'll shut that off, so I'm not sure what this board does up here, um, this board's got 2 TO3, series pass power transistors on there with the look of them bolted to this heat sink which then doubles back on itself I'm going to find out what this board does here board uh, A I can't remember I can't see if I A5 or 6 let's just zoom in and see what it says I 
think it's A6, yeah. So I'm going to find out what A6 does because these test points are not reading sort of what I would expect. I would expect, you know, different voltages on there, but there isn't really. It's, they're, they're like very low voltages, if anything, and well below 5 volts. And it just seems a bit strange that you'd have two big series pass transistors on there, and yet the test points hardly read anything. So I'm going to look at that next as well. I mean, it might be... A battery charger board it might be a regulator board for the battery charger circuit because the the board at the bottom here is a transformer for the battery charger bit and i think the regulation of it might be done up here perhaps i don't know but this board's working anyway so far the main regulator um but it could be as well without reading the manual just off the top of my head it could be that the low current output from here um, is fed up to this board and then there's a series pass regulator then which uh, provides higher current at different supply rails so I just need to check that in the manual see what that does a function of it the next thing I'd like to do after that is verify the supplies are reaching the um, the logic board um, which is at the top there uh, this board here is a logic board. Now I assume some of these test points here will be for the supplies to this board. So we'll check these uh, supplies are getting to all the boards. So I thought that'll be the next step after uh, ascertaining what this supply section is, and then go from there. I think. Now I've looked on the other side of the test set. I won't turn it around just yet. But on the motherboard, there are lots, hundreds of through-hole connections, solder through holes, little islands where the solder. Um, connects through to the top end to this side of the board from the bottom end so that's also another possibility that we have uh, might have to do a bit of circuit freezer spray on there to try and reveal any dry joints and press on the board with a, an insulating tool to see where the connections come and go and perhaps the tester operates when that happens so that's something else we'll look at so I'll back shortly Okay, so um, this board at the end that we were talking about earlier with the uh, TO3 transistors on, I found out what that is. That's actually the uh, the switcher board. Uh, if we look on here, it's board A6, which is there. It's a switcher board. And then we've got a regulator U1 in the middle of the relay and the input filter there. That looks like as if those series pass transistors are the regulator. Um, obviously... Uh, with the look of it, um, it would appear that's all working, that A6 board anyway, because obviously that then feeds the input to which is A5, uh, which is the output board, which is where we measured all the supply rails there. So I'm confident that that uh, switcher board works, although it does seem a bit reverse logic how we've got a, what appears to be a, an input. Uh, looking at the arrow there's an input coming in from the top it looks like it's going into the regulator and then we've got some kind of control signal I think coming in from the bottom and that then goes to the relay there K1 now I wouldn't understand why you'd have a regulator just supplying power to a relay it does seem a bit strange does that so I don't know if the you know, how that operates to be honest with you. I'm going to have to look at the theory of operation in the uh, technical description for board A6 to find out how that works but basically um, there's DC in there, switcher board, input filter goes over to that relay contact um, so I don't know it seems strange but anyway we've got uh, we, we definitely got the the other board here working which is a main one all the supplies are coming out as it should be there's indicated on the right so I don't see what the issue is with uh, any of the power supply section at the moment it, it doesn't look like it's a power supply fault at the moment this it looks more to do with um, possibly an issue with the, uh, the, the, the boards themselves or dry joints on the bottom now uh, there are islands that connect through to the top side of the board from the bottom so that it could be that we've got a few of those that are dry so I think we'll advance on to the logic board diagram now on the service manual um, I'll see what uh, TP points on there should be getting whatever um, supplies see whether we're getting the supplies to the logic board that we should be 
and then I can start looking at uh, other things from there. If we're getting supplies to all the boards properly and the rails are there and they're not um, got any disconnection to them then I think the next stage from there once we've established supplies are getting to all the boards uh, one by one because uh, that's definitely what we'd need to ascertain because if we've got supply going to one board and not the other for example uh, they're obviously using communication protocols between each board to transfer data serially from one board to the next so if one board's not powered up it can't communicate serially so it might prevent the clock signals or whatever getting to the other boards or it might not be able to um, to sync with the data or provide data when it needs to and therefore the microcontroller might uh, might say that there's an issue so we've just got to um, establish supply rails to all boards and ensure they're there and then from there we need to then look at other things that come beyond supply issues which is data communication, dry joints, um, burned out components or loose components, dry solder joints on, on through hole PCB feed throughs and perhaps do some resoldering if need be and uh, and try and trace the fault from there so we'll be back shortly so I just pulled out the uh, MCPU card just for a moment just to have a glance at it um, I think uh, as we go back to um, these test points here measuring what's perhaps on here assuming of course there are supplies uh, available there then uh, we'll measure them but uh, just noticing there's a couple of crystals here. We've got a, a clock crystal down there which probably runs a processor. Um, so we can check that's running. Uh, we can do some tests using the um, spectrum analyzer on that. That seems to be running at uh, 3.3 um, megahertz. So call it 3.3. Five seven megahertz, so we could check that's running. That's obviously uh, going to be fed off then as an amplified clock signal, or divided down, or whatever, or multiplied up, whichever. To then the uh, the microprocessor, which is the MC sixty eight two one P processor. Uh, we've got two of them. Uh, looks like we've got some firmware, which will be stored on these UVE proms. Um, which are obviously uh, potentially there could be a supply issue there on those there's various things that could be wrong on this board uh, we've got another crystal here running at 1.8 megahertz that might be for the serial bus um, do notice a bit of discoloration just here not sure what that is so we could check the pins on the ICs as well might be a bit of glue stuff or something I'm not sure um, but with lots of through holes like these that you can see all over so you can spend many hours you know if you've ruled out supply issues um, and the usual common failures such as dry joints things like that on the uh, IC pins or uh, the edge connectors at the bottom here that connect to this strip on the motherboard then you're down to a very time consuming laborious job of taking each board out and reworking every single through hole uh, there is a technique which I might have to go into late in the video where you circuit freeze and it reveals which uh, solder joints are um, not connecting through the board because it freezes at a different rate um, so that's an easy way we've got a lithium battery I'm going to check the supply voltage on that got another crystal down here as well uh, again that's running at uh, 4 megahertz so we'll need to check that's functioning maybe um, that will give us a good indication of particular faults in different areas um, so we'll look at that but again it could be down to the fact that we've got uh, dry joints as well on the through holes and they're all over this instrument on every board including the motherboard so I'm just going to get to the diagram now for this board and check what should be on these uh, test points and then we'll go from there So just looking at some of the theory of operation etc that's uh, that's on this instrument um, we've got a bit of information on the processor here um, it says that uh, the general communication systems or the communication systems analyzer 
It can perform nine basic functions. It can act as a generator, a watt meter, a monitor, a duplex generator, a chord synthesizer, a frequency counter, digital voltmeter, and it says it can also uh, provide an oscilloscope, a distortion synod meter, general operation of the unit will simultaneously incorporate all these functions. It says uh, the following discussion will cover the block diagrams for each of the basic functions plus the discussion on the processor control of the system. A functional block diagram of the total system is shown at the end of the uh, section in figure 2.1. To clarify the total system configuration, only the major signal paths between each modules are shown. So, as for the processor, which are, are these uh, 6800 series uh, Motorola processors, it says uh, the system control is, is the primary responsibility of the internal pro microprocessor. To control the operating mode, the processor manipulates inputs from front panel controls and system status inputs from the front panel. The processor monitors the keyboards, the function select switch, the modulation control switch, the RF scan switch, the image switch, the bandwidth switch, the horizontal and vertical range switches, and the step attenuator switch. This information plus internal status information causes the processor to display the appropriate information on the cathode ray tube. To program the center frequency to set up the generate and monitor mode, and to make the internal switching arrangements for the selected operating state. <clears throat> now in regards to the processor bus it says the interface to and from the microprocessor is via the processor bus. The bus consists of a 16-bit address bus, an 8-bit data bus and a 7-bit control bus. The bus interface is the processor to its program memory, ROM, read-only memory, scratch pad memory, RAM, random access memory, an IEEE interface option, cellular mobile telephone option and the peripheral interface adapters PIA. The PIA is a mechanism by which the processor interfaces with the system. A PIA consists of a dual 8-bit latch which may be programmed as either an input or an output for the microprocessor system. System input and control information passes to and from the microprocessor via these three system control buses attached to a PIA which is located on the processor interface board A11. Now it goes on to talk about the control buses and it says the three control buses within the system analyzer are called the RF control bus and AF control buses 1 and 2. It says the AF control buses consist of a 4-bit address bus a 4-bit data bus and two, and two enable lines. The four address bits determine which of the 16 possible latches the four bits of data are to be sent to and received from. It says the enable lines trigger the actual transfer of data. The RF control bus is a clocked serial bus which consists of five data lines, a clock line and a latch line. The serial data stream is 24 bits long, tables 2 through 1 and 2-6 show the buses and the function of each data bit. Figure 2, 2 at the end of this section shows the overall bus structure of the system analyzer. So we've got a bit of information there about um, how that uh, logic bus operates and, the, um, and obviously there's details there about the AF bus control. Um, plus other bits of information, the RF bus control and the data bits and things which we may need to uh, to look at further. But I think the starting point is um, with what was suggested to me by uh, the guy who owns it that um, I don't know what, uh, I'll need to ask this question next time I see him about why he took it, took it upon himself to pull the boards out and, and push the boards back in again and he did say when I last spoke to him about it that this test set worked uh, the display was working and the functions were working but I think there may be another issue I'm not sure that necessitated him to take the boards out and push them back in and once he'd removed the boards and pushed them back in the test set didn't work again well that could be flexing the board as manipulated one of these little through hole uh, type 
connections on the PCB and then broken a, a connection through and it does seem strange the first time we turned it on we didn't get any scan at all across the display second time we turned it on after we'd had this board out and pushed it back in again then the display is scanning although other functions aren't working so I am at the moment anyway rightly or wrongly siding on the possibility that we could have a dry joint sit situation so we'll have a look at the supplies now uh, and then we'll go from there Right, I've uh, been doing some manipulation testing before. I've been unable to find any information on these test points here in the circuit diagram. I've got the logic uh, diagram up now. Now, the thing is, the uh, what's awkward about this is there's two processors on this board. However, the diagram shows only one processor being used. And um, what's strange about it is that it's... Uh, if you notice there on the uh, left side, it's actually that chip there, U22, uh, um, which appears to have a, uh, when I get the mouse pointer, this U22 here. Um, that There's actually another process identical to it in this area to the left where those resistors are. The rest of the board's correct with the layout that it shows on the diagrams. Um, but that's a bit tricky so I was looking to see on the schematic diagrams where the uh, uh, where the the layouts okay but I was trying to find on the diagrams where the 5 volt input comes in see whether there's an onboard regulator or something as well like there is on a lot of these boards that I've noticed in this particular test set there's not only the power supply section at the back, but there's actually an onboard voltage regulator as well. So I've just been trying to find where the 5 volts comes in on. But interestingly enough, what I've done, which I've uh, is a common fault finding technique, especially for dry joint issues, is I've um, bent the board like that, or pulled it from one side to the other, and then switched the test set on and see whether it clears the fault. And I've done this with all the boards. Now I've noticed... This here is the character generator board for the VDU, I believe. And when I uh, I move this board, the audio tone changes from the power on. So I'll just demonstrate that now. So there seems to be... Uh, Seems to be something strange with this board when you move that around. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have a look at these uh, these boards. I think this is definitely a dry joint myself. I could be wrong, but uh, we'll we'll see. I'll pull this board, see what's uh, what's going on on there. But uh, I've got the rail on this board where the supplies are. All these little orange uh, tantalum capacitors. They all uh, connect over the 5 volt rail, so I can check to see if it's 5 volts. I suspect there will be myself. The uh, lithium battery down there is 3.3 volts, that's okay. 3 volts, so we know that's alright. Um, but I've got a, a sneaky suspicion we've got a dry issue here, either on the motherboard, which these boards connect into at the bottom there, or these individual boards. So, But that's interesting now, moving that. It's the only board out of all of them that when you move it, it uh, it makes this funny change in frequency. So we will see what uh, what that is when we get it out. Well, just uh, as an experiment, just to see whether this uh, entire thing is down to that board that was here. I've removed this board that was there. Um, this is the offending article that was making all that noise. And uh, when you bent the board as well, the PCB, it uh, changed the pitch, did the uh, tone that was coming out. Now, from what I understand, I need to absorb the service manual, and that's where uh, a cup of tea and a biscuit comes in handy, is to uh, absorb the theory of operation and all the diagrams. Now, I believe this is the processor interface card that uh, does the character generation for the... Uh, VDU for the CRT display 
as well as interface between other boards and the processor and obviously it's got quite a few logic gates on it but it's full of these uh, through hole uh, lands that you can see there all those little dots are all through holes through to the other side you see and I think when we're flexing this board it's got a dry joint it's coming and going there's something wrong on here it's got an onboard uh, let me get that wire out of the way it's got an onboard voltage regulator down there which is a um, a 7815 voltage regulator I believe um, just just there that thing as well so I think that'll be okay but we'll check uh, everything I've got a funny feeling this is this fault might be down to this board actually but who knows we've got the display up uh, none of the keys but there again we don't know that because obviously we won't be able to display the image on there anyway but I can't, um, without that board being in, the image wouldn't be displayed. But the these are not registering. Uh, it could be that these functions through these keys and the keypads are read by that board that was in here, in that slot. The processor interface board, which is, which is this. It could be this reads all those keystrokes and key presses and then passes it on to the processor board as well. So we need to absorb that. In the in the manuals how that operates but none of the controls are working so I think I'm a little closer than I was um, so there's a couple of outstanding things really I need to uh, I got sidetracked a little obviously and just trying to manipulate the boards to see whether I could get one of the boards to, to you know to misbehave which I could with that one but I still need to get verify the supply voltages I get into the microprocessor board so that's definitely something that's still outstanding I now need to look at this board more closely in the uh, circuit diagram and the um, theory of operation to find out what this does precisely and uh, possibly resolder all these uh, through all connections that you can see which will take a few hours to do I would have thought maybe with a uh, half an hour or whatever with flux and soldering iron um, I'll use probably the pace uh, desoldering station to suck the solder from every uh, every um, island and then obviously replace it with new new solder and then we'll put the board back in and see whether it works it'd be great if I had another one of these test sets because we could just change the boards uh, that's a really quick way of being able to find out which board's faulty because so I've had quite a few cases in the in the recent past where I've looked at other pieces of equipment that got removable boards and you sort of convince yourself that a fault's on one particular board and it can actually be on a couple of them or a few or it can be on a totally opposite board but the function doesn't um, unless you understand fully what should and shouldn't work under certain scenarios then uh, you might lead yourself down the garden path and look at something totally irrelevant so but anyway at least the display is functioning we've got uh, you know but these controls none of them are working and we did have this awful tone coming out and um, all this horrible sound and uh, I've got I've got a feeling it could be that board myself, but uh, we'll we'll have to do some further digging now and concentrate on that and the voltage measurement on the logic board. So back soon. Hello everyone. Here we are again now with the uh, board out the test set. Uh, the, this is the board where, in the previous part of the video, when we flexed it, bent the board uh, in its mounting. It's held down the edges here. In a frame, a metal frame inside the uh, inside the test set. It's got these runners that are down here. That it slots into. Um, when we flex the board back and forth, we had uh, what appears to be the symptoms of a dry joint. Uh, the audio tone that it was emitting, which sounds like some kind of an error tone or something out of lock or uh, some kind of uh, feedback circuit not working properly. It changed its note quite considerably when we bent the circuit board. Now I think that um, some of these um, through hole lands here um, and as you can see there are hundreds of them all over the circuit board everywhere so obviously this is going to be quite a labour intensive 
repair. Now what I'm going to do, just to explain quickly how I'm going to tackle this. Um, if I spend about an hour on this board, I've got my, uh, my flux here and my isopropanol alcohol circuit cleaner. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start from the bottom part portion of the circuit board and work up in sections. And uh, what else I'll do is I'll put a, for each square section that I do, I'll put a little biro mark on the edge of the board here. So I know I've done up to there and then same for that section, same for that section. Because the phone's only got to ring once or somebody comes in to speak to me and then the next thing you know I've lost where I was. So I'm going to mark out roughly um, in sections on the board where I've soldered to in, in like grids so I don't miss anything. So I'm going to re-solder all the ICs. Um, I'm also going to re-solder as many of the islands as I possibly can. Um, there is a technique by using circuit freezer which I used to use quite a lot and uh, by spraying circuit freezer on the circuit board it can reveal which of the um, through holes are actually dry joint because they, they go a different the freeze at a different rate uh, or thaw out at a different rate so it's also useful to use circuit freezer in circuit when you're trying to find a fault on a circuit board by spraying circuit freezer on different components and um, and that can cause them to totally fail altogether if they're on the way out or they're not performing properly as they should be such as logic gates etc um, or pumps uh, and other through hole components that can be affected by temperature so by employing circuit freeze in different parts of the circuit if you can get to it in this case i can't because i haven't got an extender card to extend the the card out the test set so I'm just going to have to bite the bullet and re-solder every single connection on all the ICs because even the pins on the ICs have also got uh, a connection underneath as well as a connection on top so they themselves, the legs become through holes um, so I'm going to re-solder all the circuit board as much as I can spend an hour two hours on it doing it um, and then we'll put it back in and what I'll also do as well uh, underneath the test set, the motherboard the opposite connector for this at the bottom I'll re-solder that as well on the underside so the next time I come back I'll have done that work and uh, well we'll show you some of the soldering um, technique in a moment and what we're going to do in the in the next phase okay so uh, this is just showing you what I'd, I'd be doing I'll be getting me my flux and uh, then I'll be applying it, you see, on these little islands. It dries fairly quickly as well, so you've got to be fairly sharpish with it, otherwise it'll dry off, especially the heat that we're getting at the moment here in the UK on today's uh, repair job. It's over 30 degrees in the workshop. It's quite hot, so I'm just going to give those just a little re-solder and uh, I'll show you how we we do that now you can if you want to spend a million years on it depending on how much time you've got on your hands uh, you can actually um, suck the solder off these these islands and then renew the solder but I'm not going to bother doing that just to be quite honest with you it's too long of a job that and uh, the other thing is is that you do actually get very pure results with that because it can scratch the print on the circuit board and all sorts of things so I'm going to change the bit on the iron because this iron is too big the the bit but I just wanted to show you on the video quickly what I, I will be doing I will be you know just touching the the islands letting the flux do its job and I'm just basically that's all I'm doing just resolding now I might add uh, when I've got this, the thinner bit on, which uh, I'm showing you at the moment, I, will, I might add the, um, some solder to these as well, as part of that repair. Um, so, obviously, you know, that's something that um, I might consider doing. But then, what can easily happen there, when you add additional solder to what's already on the board, is islands can short out together. And when that happens, then unfortunately, you can then create a fault without knowing it. Unless you keep an eye on what you're doing, 
and you're very circumspect as to how you solder and you check everything once it's been done. So I'm not right happy about applying extra solder if I don't need to. If I see a dry joint that's, you know, like that for example, it's got a hole there, I'll probably apply more solder to that because I can tell that that's been dry and it's, it's left a, a bit of a hole. And it's, it's not covering well, you see, it's messy. So that definitely needs more solder on it. So we'll, we'll definitely be applying more solder to that kind of a joint as well as to that one perhaps as well. So that's the method that I'm going to be using um, and sometimes as well when we turn the board over and we look at the, the lands on the other side you can see where some solders gathered more than on other islands as well so uh, I might use solder braid uh, that I've got just to mop up the, the solder and then renew perhaps with new solder so that's always I don't like using solder braid too much on, on the screen side of the board because it can pull the etching off and expose the copper tracks and it, it can be quite violent on and you get little strands of copper braid left behind sometimes so if you're not careful if you're not looking at it from under a microscope or, uh, or a magnifier uh, which I've, I'm using here then you could quite easily call short circuit so you've just got to be really really careful I mean all the uh, the joints on the um, apart from obviously there's a bit of tarnishing going on in this area here um, they're not too bad although it depends on how the light casts its shadow on those solder islands but the pins on the chips um, some of them are not looking too good they're quite grey dry colour so I think we're going to have to spend a lot of time probably a you know that that one there is looking a bit uh, a bit dicey as well that one in the middle between that one and this one you can probably just see it there right in the middle I'm not sure if I can magnify it so that looks to me like as if it's a possible dry joint so there's there's dry joints all over the place on this board I think there's probably dry joints on the other boards so I think it's just a case of biting the bullet and just uh, really thoroughly inspecting the boards, resoldering everything in sight and then um, plugging the board back in. Now since making the last section of the video I um, had a chance to speak to the friend of mine who, who owns this and uh, basically said that um, you know the, the the boards were unplugged and then pushed back in again to try and get the test set to work I think it was one of these things where there was some in, intermittent issues on it to start with but the nice thing about it is, is I think it can be repaired if we just pay a little bit of uh, attention spend some time don't rush it you know a cup of tea and a biscuit you know in hand uh, do 20 minutes have a break and then come back to it uh, just carry on soldering all those uh, little islands that we've got and uh, see if we can re-solder every single one of those um, and then take it from there touch wood you know when it's put back in it may actually work you know again we've got a little hole there that's appeared as well just uh, just there in, in that land that's not a good sign so yeah, I think uh, that one's looking pretty dry down there as well. So I think it's just a case of resoldering everything. It's a shame the chips aren't socketed really, but uh, not to worry. We'll resolder it all and then come back. Right, so just as an example, I'll uh, just show, you know, a couple of these being resoldered. Those four there as well. So the technique uh, that you generally use for soldering these, you can use this is obviously lead solder that I'm using. It's um, obviously you know multi-core flux solder because this is before the days of lead-free solder. So we've put some flux in this area here 
and normally I use a magnifier to open it but I'm using it in this case to show you guys so and uh, and basically then what we're doing is I'll just pull a bit extra out here so we can get to it um, the technique is just to go over you can add just a little bit just a little bit and then carry on with the next one you can do a little bit as well and that's what you can generally do going around but generally speaking just re-soldering um, some of these connections try not to burn anything or or touch any capacitors I'm going in at a weird angle here you see to show you guys but it's uh, it's basically you know very difficult for me to show you and, and solder normally because of the angle I'm coming in at because I've got the camera on the magnifier just to show you guys uh, how it's done but uh, just a little bit of solder not not much just a tiny bit and then you don't have a big blob and then you get joints like these down here that I've already done so they're not bulbous they're just level with the board but this new solder so that's what we'll do uh, likewise again when you look at these joints these are you know these are pretty pretty ropey and uh, it's a long drawn out process you know it depends on how quick you are as well at, uh, at soldering um, obviously some people are very are very quick at soldering and others aren't um, but again it's this technique to just going round everything and re-soldering everything as much as you can and uh, renewing solder where necessary so that's the that's the process now it's very difficult for me to show you properly how I do it because I've got the camera right above where I'd be soldering and I'm coming in at a really low angle almost flat with a bench whereas normally I'd be coming in sort of from above and I can just go do 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 round them all you see but just for your benefit I've just put the camera on top of the magnifier so you can see uh, what I'm doing but it's I need the magnifier for my own eyes because my eyes aren't good enough to be able to see all this without a magnifier and because the camera's using the magnifier I can't I have to do everything by eye <laughs> so it makes it more difficult for me so it was just to show you guys the just general principles that's all to uh, redoing the lands, uh, the islands for all connections, and, uh, and we'll just carry on with it now. Okay, so following on from the last video where we resoldered the uh, sculpt board, which is here, uh, which is uh, I think it's E E two. Um, we sorry A seven board. We resoldered that in the last video, all the through holes and. I resoldered all the chips nice ease, put it back together and when we wiggled the board about in the um, socket it didn't then produce an awful tone and um, but it still didn't work so in between that video and this video what I've done I've, I've resoldered the microprocessor interface card which is a A11 uh, this board here uh, that then allowed all the operation to come back I resoldered much the same as I did on this board, all the through holes. The um, uh, I haven't resoldered all the chip legs yet, but I resoldered all the through holes. And when that happened, then it started to work, with the exception of the text. Now, I've got the oscilloscope working. I've verified that before making this video. The oscilloscope works, and the audio gen uh, output works. The spectrum analyzer is working. We've got a it's selected to spectrum analyze at the moment but what it is the, the issue is is the text that's displayed uh, from the microcontroller is um, it's very difficult to work make out on this camera but at the moment we should be seeing text all over the display and the bar graphs and everything for obviously uh, what is the duplex gen um, we should be seeing that now what what happens is is the video image that's coming from the scope section for the oscilloscope from the audio side that functions perfectly so if I go down to where it says uh, scope ACDC we can select the time base um, and we can we can make the scope trigger as well and go on to different things that seemed to work earlier because I'd I'd literally got that going um, you know and, and we were sweeping 
um, and I was measuring a one kilohertz input tone as well so that was fine there wasn't an issue with that um, and yet we don't have a green screen there either likewise uh, anything that should display text from the character generator on the microcontroller board isn't displaying on there it's like it's overdriving the CRT but yet yeah, other things like the um, spectrum analyzer we're generating a frequency there 141 megahertz I entered that in on this keypad because I knew that by um, by zooming in on the display which I'll do in a moment but if we go back to the the fault that's still there there's text here now if you keep an eye on the display very carefully I'll move these modes and you will probably see might be better with the camera with the uh, that off I'll just see whether this makes any any difference um, not sure if it will I'll try and switch modes let's have a look so we've got the spectrum analyzer you might be able to see although it's very difficult I'll see if I can get an angle on the screen I might switch that back on again it's very hard to see but you can you can see just here there's some there's some text just behind the display it's easy for me to see it in the naked eye than for you to see it but uh, you'll be able to see it move and uh, I can see that from where I'm standing here now if I go to the spectrum analyzer moment how I knew how to input the frequency is because up here should be displayed the text now it's just unfortunate the refresh rate on this camera doesn't allow you to see there is just very faint um, text on that part of the display which I can just see with my eye but you can't see it on the video which is unfortunate because I would have liked to have shown you that but basically the, the overlays of the text for the um, functions are there but they're so faint in the display it's unbelievable so I don't think the issue is a CRT problem I think it's something to do with the video output the, um, there's, there's a horizontal, a vertical and a z-axis drive that comes from the character generator to the um, CRT board uh, now I've done some resoldering more on the CRT board which is this board here um, that board deals with the CRT drive I've resoldered that I've tried doing adjustments as well but I can't get the text to display clearly now when I went to the spectrum analyzer I did manage to um, uh, if we can get to the spectrum analyzer again there I did manage to see the frequency that was written here uh, which is 141 megahertz so I've entered in on the um, 2968 141 megahertz and we're injecting a signal level there and as you can see it is resolving it quite nicely now if I switch the RF generator off on the uh, radio test set you can see that the signal goes and then it comes back so it's obviously working as a spectrum analyzer um, just wipe the lens yeah so it's obviously working correctly insofar as that it's just the text that's been generated by the um, by the microcontroller uh, there's two there's a microcontroller and a microcontroller interface card well I resolded the microcontroller interface card because earlier uh, when we wiggled this board about back and forth it did all sorts of crazy things which you saw in the early part of the video but when I did it with that as well it went all crazy the lights started flickering and changing and it was trying to do all sorts of weird and wonderful things so again a very lengthy process of a couple of hours resoldering everything on that on that board so I've got more to resolder on that yet I haven't finished with that I've got some chips to resolder but I just thought I'd do all the through all joints first and then I'll come back to it a bit later depending on what's uh, what's what so I think one of the next fault diagnosis things I can do is to uh, look at 
perhaps retrieving the video information that will be sent to the video CRT driver board and see if I can feed that then to my oscilloscope that sits behind the Rigol, see if I can get the image that appears here for the text on these other displays um, where all the frequency information and bar charts will be displayed there see if I can get them to display on the uh, on the scope that sat behind just there so if I can do that then that might prove whether or not it's you know more to do with a video uh, drive or not um, so that's where we're at now I haven't resoldered as yet the uh, microcontroller uh, which is this board here um, that one at the end I haven't resoldered that yet and that's got lots of through all connections on it it's got the character generator on it that generates all the characters in the display so that's something I'm going to do next so we're, we're way ahead now of where we were because originally when we switched it on all it did was screech at us and um, it just basically wouldn't do anything would it and we couldn't even get into the different modes the keypad didn't work none of the knobs and switches worked so I'm very pleased that at least we're in that state now where all the controls work the CRT works because obviously we can see the oscilloscope and we can also see the spectrum analyzer it's a text that's coming from the digital board it's as if uh, the sync isn't there the video information might be there but the sync might not be there or the video is very low level what will be the character drive um, representing the video um, image of the characters the, the level of that might be too small or what I don't know but it just seems strange but uh, the text is there you can see it I can see it off camera it's very faint as you switch between the modes but I can't get the display to show it properly and uh, I have adjusted the controls on those blue potentiometers um, just there but you know it's not making any difference really for the text side of things only for uh, the general scope itself and one of the other confusing things in the service manual is Motorola refer to the scope as being what would be the CRT in, in our terms in British terms would be cathode ray tube whereas most test equipment manufacturers refer to the scope as being the oscilloscope the operation of the oscilloscope um, but they Motorola call that the scope so there's a little bit of um, confusion there when the service manual refers to scope versus oscilloscope so that's just this section of the video what I'll do is I'll uh, come back in a moment after I've done some more resoldering and uh, I think it is looking like it could potentially be a component failure or a dry joint there is potential for me to spray circuit freezer on the different boards to see whether I can get anything showing because obviously freezing components and things can change the characteristics capacitors transistors ICs so there's potential for me to go around with the circuit freezer and try and see whether we can get the fault to disappear that way and localize it more um, so yes uh, stay tuned for more okay so we're uh, progressing with the repair on the spectrum uh, well the radio test set um, Motorola radio test set we're still dealing with it we're on to the uh, logic board now <coughs> the processor board uh, which uses a Motorola 6800 microprocessor and PIOs and uh, or PIBs as are known as sort of a a bit of a tricky digital board is this lots and lots of through hole joints um, that need to be resoldered um, as you can see here some of these are you know all needed resoldering a very lengthy process to go through all of the uh, printed circuit boards soldering every single through hole uh, but what I do is I do it in stages uh, because something as complex as this requires it to be done in in stages so if I just turn it over a moment, what I do is I divide the board up into sections, sort of halves or quarters, and uh, I resolder all the put flux on, and resolder all the uh, all the uh, through holes, um, say on top of the board or underneath the board, like we are now. And then what I do then I also then start soldering all the pins on the um, on the ICs. So I literally could draw like a little pencil line 
and then I'll do that section and then I'll do the next section and so on and so forth. So as you can see here, I've actually done about half the board all the way along there. But you can see all the new solder as well as the uh, the through holes like down here for example. All there resoldered. So I do that underneath for example. Uh, I do that all in sections till I get it all done. So I don't miss anything because that's one of the problems that you can be distracted midway or somebody comes in to speak to you or phone rings or um, you know you break off for, for a um, you know five ten minutes you come back and you forget where you were so I sort of um, put either a mark on the board or masking tape or a little felt mark at the corners and and so that I can see you know where I've been working and don't forget where I've been and then um, once I've done all that underneath, then I turn the board over and then I do exactly the same again, but this time instead of soldering obviously the IC pins from above, which is not recommended obviously unless there's through holes on top, I then go and start soldering the, the top through holes as well. And the reason why I do that is because uh, basically when you solder a through hole from say one side, uh, like in this case, this these particular ones here. Sometimes if the solder is very old and it's broken in between the board, it won't run through to the other side. It'll refresh the solder on this side and it'll look like it's connecting through, but in actual fact it's electrical connection to the underside may not be present. So what I do is I resolder the, all the through holes that I can access above. Um, I resolder them all. Uh, again from the opposite side of the board so it ensures that solder runs both ways and they've both got new solder on both sides of the through hole with flux as well to make it run nicely and uh, likewise if there's any uh, um, connections above the board like this for example you have connections beneath and above I make sure that all these are resoldered as well and uh, we inspect the board very carefully for any corrosion, any breaks in tracks, cracks, anything like that, you know, and we go through it. Um, but again, it's worth doing, particularly on an instrument as old as this. This was manufactured in 1985, so naturally in 1985 this would have worked fine but as time's gone on obviously heat expansion and contraction of the boards can cause um, faults as we've seen earlier in the video flexing the boards can make faults come and go so again uh, you know sometimes you resolder a land like that one down there and you'll get a little hole appears in the middle of it and it'll change color now there's a technique to finding through holes that aren't uh, connecting through using circuit freezer and you uh, spray circuit freezer on the circuit board and they change the thaw out at a different rate to uh, through holes that are, are connected through but it's a bit of a um, tongue and cheek method is that it's not exactly reliable um, you can get uh, faults to appear and disappear as well by spraying the um, chips or the through holes area of the circuit board with circuit freezer because as it causes the board to change in um, in depth uh, it can make or break a connection as the um, board begins to thaw out so you can make faults appear using circuit freezer as well if it's a bad connection or through hole problem or even an IC um, that's going duff you know you can get the uh, IC to change um, I've had an IC that was a LCD driver on a Marconi um, microwave test set and it was a multiplex IC and its job was to multiplex the um, pixels on the LCD monitor and uh, for some reason there was an internal fault within the IC and it only showed itself um, when the IC got warm but then when you sprayed circuit freeze on the IC the fault disappeared and the monitor came back in perfect clarity and it's rare that happens but ICs can fail internally and obviously we can desolder them and take them out and test them individually as well um, but as well you can get components like this where there'll be a track that connects to a component above and uh, as well as underneath uh, when I can hold the camera still and sometimes you can get um, 
uh, solder like this that looks pretty tainted you know on the ends of resistors particularly for resistors running quite hot um, as well and I always look for tantalum capacitors for any discoloration um, or anything like that you know any capacitor whether it's a mica cap or a tantalum um, just to see whether it's short circuiting because tantalum capacitors are very very frequent uh, um, to go as well as electrolytics as well any leakage things like that so right I think it's uh, time now for a cup of tea and a biscuit um, so we've got our biscuits and our cup of tea so we're gonna have a little rest while we uh, get on to soldering the rest of the board and uh, as you can see we'll need to give this some um, cleaning with electro wash or uh, isopropanol alcohol to get rid of any flux residue which we'll do after we've resoldered the the rest of the board and once we've done that then we'll put it in the machine see if we get the video drive back for the um, text that's from the character generators now in the service manual uh, we can actually connect the video output from this um, to a an oscilloscope and uh, the issue I've got with the oscilloscope uh, that I have, this Rigol, it's only got an XY input on it. Now, in order to replicate what's on the screen on the uh, Motorola test set, um, we have to have X, Y and Z uh, inputs on an oscilloscope. So there are test points on the uh, logic board uh, with some of the information that I've read. Three test points. You can take the x and y path are basically the horizontal and vertical uh, video uh, from the character generator that's on this board and the z uh, output as well for um, scanning across the screen and you can feed that to an oscilloscope so if it's got the x y and z um, input on the oscilloscope then uh, you know you can actually uh, replicate what's on the test set screen on the on the monitor on the uh, on the oscilloscope now the problem with this Rigol with it being an entry level oscilloscope it's only got the the X and the Y it doesn't have a Z unfortunately but I do have some Tektronics oscilloscopes which actually need repair which do have X Y and Z and I've got a Teledyne Lacroix uh, oscilloscope as well a really good one but again that's got a faulty power supply so anyway, I spoke to a friend of mine who's got a, I think, a scope with an X, Y, and a Z path. So that will tell us whether or not um, there's an issue with the uh, CRT or the uh, display board. Um, basically, the character generator on here generates characters on the display by accessing random access memory or RAM. And it then stores the contents of a RAM, um, which is the characters that we're wanting to display on the CRT. And um, what it does is it uh, places a dot. Uh, how it does that is it scans from uh, horizontally and vertically and across. And it will place a pinpoint a dot in a particular location on the screen that's uh, referenced in the RAM. And to make up a character, it will then place another dot, another dot, another dot, and another dot. And it will then make up characters as it scans. It sweeps across the display. But how it does that is it generates characters by scanning the RAM, storing the contents of the RAM into a latch, and then the latch goes to what's called a PIO interface, which are, are these. Uh, they in turn then create what is a, a luminance output, which is, um, according to the service manual, a character generator and that then obviously creates uh, three outputs an X Y and a Z uh, sync output which then is fed off then to I think it's a7 the scope board the scope board then um, has a, 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 a switch IC basically it's a logic IC and it has inputs from the spectrum analyzer video inputs from the oscilloscope video and then input then from what is a character generator here. And depending on what function we select on the uh, on the test set with these LEDs, 
uh, that indicate what mode the test sets in, such as TXR, X duplex, things like that. It will then display the appropriate characters, but in doing so, what it will do is it will switch the inputs to the IC, which um, controls the video. And so, for example, it's wanting duplex test. If you select that, it will then um, get the appropriate measurements uh, into the character generator for TX power, frequency deviation, various other aspects. And it will then display that uh, by accessing random access memory, storing all that information in the latch and then via a PIO then output that as a dot to many dots, hundreds of thousands of dots that represent the image on the screen and it will overlay that as well with say the spectrum analyzer so the video from the spectrum analyzer will be combined with the text generation from the microcontroller so you'll get text at the top of the screen and then you'll have the spectrum analyzer video. So we've got a logic IC like this that controls the video inputs, if you like, from the different data streams coming in. So one in stream will be from the character generator, the other stream will be from, say, an oscilloscope, spectrum analyzer um, or some other audio generator, for example. And then those video outputs will be combined as, as part of the display then to the CRT. Now, um, obviously this machine's got a fault where the CRT is displaying mainly green and text that does appear at the beginning when the CRT is first powered on is in black, whereas it should be the other way around. The text should be in green and the rest of the screen should be black. It's like the video is inverse. Now, there could be many reasons for that. It could actually be a CRT overdrive. Um, also on earlier models of this there's a luminance control by uh, accessible through a little hole which adjusts a potentiometer on the high voltage power supply which then obviously goes supplies the the tube now if that outputs too high the luminance on the display on the front is is actually too high and in other words it could potentially be um causing uh, you know an over brightness issue so it may be that the video content is making it to the scope driver board here the CRT driver board but uh, the actual monitors being overdriven because of the um, luminance control now unfortunately on this model of test set we don't have the access hole because on the manual that I have for the earlier version of this it shows a little access hole and what you're meant to do is put a high voltage probe under the cap here and uh, adjust the potentiometer in there for 2000 volts and then obviously as you adjust the control on the front the brightness and contrast controls on here mainly the brightness it'll adjust the output up to 4 kV or down to lower than 2 kV to um, compensate so therefore the display brightness will, will alter now unfortunately this not having the access hole, uh, according to the service manual for this particular version you're meant to use an extender because this comes out as a plug-in module and down there there's actually a socket. Um, so in other words you'd extend it up here, take the case off which is uh, these screws and uh, which would access a potentiometer like one of these that's mounted on the high voltage power supply and that then you can adjust the luminance. So. There's theories as well that uh, it could be using a different gun as well. The cathode ray tube may have one gun that displays the character information that comes from the microcontroller. Another gun might be used then to display other things such as a spectrum analyzer and also the oscilloscope. The manual's a little bit vague on the CRT side of things, how that works, but um, it's, poss it's possibly the, the reason. Um, so I need to rule out the CRT or this board or the high voltage power supply being an issue. The CRT does work with the spectrum analyzer and the oscilloscope fine. It's just a text generation that comes from the um, control board. So I'm wondering whether or not the CRT has been overdriven. Uh, because the image on the spectrum analyzer and the oscilloscope does look rather too bright very bright and when we adjust the brightness control on the front of the instrument it doesn't change the luminance level of the uh, monitor so 
it could be that the CRT has been overdriven. So there's method in the madness in that uh, these test outputs here, um, three of them are X, Y and Z suite patterns. So potentially if I get an oscilloscope that's got X, Y and Z uh, inputs on, I can replicate what should be shown on the CRT on the oscilloscope. So that's what I'd like to do. And that would rule out this board. It would also rule out any of the other boards. And then we would be looking at perhaps this PCB and the... Um, which, that's a scope drive amplifier board and this there is the um, high voltage power supply now um, I haven't measured the output of this yet um, because we're getting a picture with everything else on the CRT so um, I think it's a combination of lack of understanding lack of detail in the manual as to how that video image is combined with other images that are coming from elsewhere in the instrument to be displayed on the CRT. Is it using the same gun as the rest of the measurements that are being um, read out on the display? Or is it using a separate um, gun? Is it using a combined gun for all video? I'm not sure. So we're going to have to look at that. So I think first things first, we'll rule out the dry joint syndrome that we've had with every other board on this test set. Resolder all the through holes and uh, make sure that they're all resoldered and um, following that then we can go on to the rest of it and uh, once we've ruled out dry joint problems and every IC, every through hole, every component on this logic board has been uh, resoldered then we can start looking at other things so I'm going to have a cup of tea and a biscuit I think that by the time we've done this test set uh, this pack of biscuits will have gone those custard creams, so we'll come back after we've uh, resoldered all these. Okay, we've uh, resoldered the digital board that goes at the end there, and uh, everything's just as it was before, really. There's signs of text appearing on the display, but it's very weak, and um, so it's definitely not a dry joint on the uh, logic board. We've ruled that out. Anyway, I started looking at the CRT uh, neck uh, where we've got the connections that go on to the guns and I noticed that uh, there's been some previous repair work done and you can just about see there uh, there's the um, high voltage um, taps that are going on to the uh, wires and they seem to be, uh, um, well seem to have been repaired they've broken the leads and then they've been repaired and uh, this wire here broke off actually when I'd unplugged this socket anyway I read an article on this it's a common fault on these test sets that these wires break off where they, they connect underneath and there's some like rubberized um, compound that prevents arcing but basically the wires as they attach onto the solder lugs, the break off. Now, unfortunately, these look like some kind of supply, so they go down to this uh, high voltage board, which is contained in this can. Now, this is a luminance control there, and there isn't a hole in the back, because this faces the back of the unit, about here, and uh, there isn't a hole in the, in the back there, to get a screwdriver in to adjust it. Now on the earlier models this was stood up and there was an access hole from the side so you basically adjusted it you know that way. So it could be that somebody's adjusted this as well and uh, the luminance is too bright so I can always do minor adjustments slot it back in power it up and then a minor adjustment again and so on and so forth because there is a, a marker there that uh, that tells us where the point is pointing so anyway in order to get this far I've had to uh, take photographs of the transistors which uh, go on there those three um, transistors which I've got photos of we've, we've kept them down there um, so I know where they go back but yeah, so this is the HT line output transformer that supplies the high voltage to the um, cathode ray tube. Um, that sets the voltage. 
and um, these little white wires that go off to the uh, neck of the CRT tube. Oh, it's dropped on the floor that cam, but this um, these connections here they come back down and solder to various points on the board. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to check continuity between where the solder on the circuit board down there and uh, right way up to the connections on the tube here because it could be that if I've broken there this wire that I've resoldered here uh, originally the piece that came off it was uh, was this piece here and it was flattened out it was uh, really bad you know it was pinched in so I'm not sure whether the wire had broken a second time further back but anyway that's the best way to do it is check continuity from where it leaves the PCB right the way to here and um, double check all those connections and then reassemble it and uh, then we can always adjust this trimmer here gradually to see whether that alters the luminance because it could be over repaired it before tweak this right round trying to get it to work and then in doing so getting the supply in and out has broken these wires because it's all tucked in the back there with that PCB pushed on the back of this tube here so yeah interesting but uh, can't see any uh, evidence of dry joints really just being a bit careful with it because um, basically the CRT tube acts as one big giant capacitor and if that's charged up to 4 kV 4000 volts um, you know touching things in the high voltage area could get uh, quite a nasty shock so what I'm going to do in a moment is I'm just going to ground that uh, stick a screwdriver to the case of the uh, test set and, and put a screwdriver under that cap there just to discharge it before I start working on this properly but uh, I can see there's a bit of soot uh, where the high voltage has attracted the dust molecules and things like that so I'm just looking to see if there's any dry joints or anything one or two places that I think could do with a a bit of a resolder but nothing that stands out that could cause a fault or would be obvious as a defect um, everything seems okay the high voltage side is uh, all under encapsulant which is down here under all this um, snot but um, yeah so uh, we might just do one or two little things but I think we're clutching at the straws I just need to check that the um, um, wires that solder onto the board that go up to the neck of the uh, CRT are all uh, are all in place and have electrical continuity because they're very fragile they're a bit like coaxial cable with a very fine inner for high voltage applications so that's what we'll do and uh, come back very shortly okay we've put the uh, unit back together again now uh, we've checked the continuity between the wire ends here where they connect to the circuit board and here and they're all they're all fine now uh, we've put the transistors back in in the order that they came out in and what i've done as well is i've uh, done a continuity uh, test on the um, meter just to make sure that the um, being TO3 packages the um, outer case here which is one of the uh, either a collector or a uh, emitter on these transistors normally it's a collector um, these mustn't touch the chassis or that's why they've got these insulators so just to be on the safe side, what I've done is I've um, connected the, uh, I'm trying to do it one-handed while I've got the other, you know, I don't want any any continuity like that on any of the transistors. So that means then the mica washers that are underneath have got a, um, have been penetrated either with a piece of solder or a speck of metal, metallic dust that can pierce through the, insulate and cause these outer counts to short against the case because the case is obviously zero volts so any supply on these uh, transistors will be shorted to ground and could cause the major faults so just wise to check when you put transistors back in 
um, they don't have insulating washers either around the screws which a lot of transistors employ so if they're slightly at an angle then the threads of the screw going through into the case it goes through a hole in the case to the PCB on the underside um, goes into these eyelets where the screws connect so in theory if the board's not sat properly what can happen is, is that the transistors can be skewed a bit and if that happens the threads of these uh, screws as they go through the hole for this well the sides of the threads will touch the metal framework the case and cause a short circuit so whenever you replace transistors like this put it back in so it's worth checking the insulation still there right we'll uh, reconnect it all put it back in the in the unit connect the um that socket there onto the back of the um crt tube i've insulated best i can uh, those wires just for this test purpose and uh, we'll see what happens now right we've uh, reached the end of the road now regarding this test set for the time being until uh, i receive another instrument where we can uh, change the boards over with uh, we've got two obstacles which we need to overcome with this now um, first obstacle is that um, we have no extender um, adapters that come with the Motorola test sets they're sort of hidden in the test set and this has them missing but uh, I've been told that they used to come with the uh, extender cards so you can pull a card out and then slot the extender in and then it raises a card up so you can default finding alignments adjustments now we haven't got that in this case so it's going to be very difficult to uh, do some repairs uh, unless we know which board it is it's actually defective so what I'm going to do is I've got a friend another friend who's got one of these test sets that's also faulty the power supply set has got an issue I believe I'm gonna ask if I can borrow a, the test set to repair it for him but also uh, to remove a card from the other test set that is a known worker and so far as the display is concerned to um, change the boards in with this um, now the, the long and short of it is, is that um, on the diagram down here um, we have a character generator on the logic board which generates all the characters that are displayed on the screen um, on here now what happens is, is when you select different modes on here uh, there's a digital switch on the uh, scope board that uh, interleaves all the video inputs or the luminance inputs for uh, character generation and spectrum analyzer together with oscilloscope for example and it multiplexes all the incoming video information from different screens text information as well as overlaying the spectrum analyzer and it will then input that on the screen now what we've got is uh, when we go to things like duplex gen etc uh, and the other screens you can just about see text starting to change on the screens it's more prevalent when the uh, the test is switched off and then um, switch back on again and you can see like a checkerboard it says self test and then it goes through its self test routine by you know going through all this malarkey and then we get to that screen which is DVM distortion meter but if I go right up to spectrum analyzer you can just about see um, I used to be able to see up there some frequency information uh, written at the top it depends how this screen's been on a while but if it's cold the test set when it first switches on you can actually see very faint text information here on the uh, front of a test set on the on the uh, display so with that uh, it's very difficult very faint I can just about see it with the naked eye but as you go through the different modes um, you can see the text information changing that's the oscilloscope and then that's the just about see it might be more prevalent from a different angle perhaps but uh, it's really weird it's uh, text information is it's very faint it's there but it's very faint 
Anyway, the spectrum analyzer works fine, and uh, that's all okay. I mean, I can generate a signal. The oscilloscope works fine. I go to RX test on this, and uh, you know, we've got the frequency. I read the frequency that was up here, although it was very faint. And then uh, now we can see a nice RF spectrum there that's coming in on the uh, RF input here. So the oscilloscope works fine. Uh, that works fine. The rest of the functions all work fine. The gen out and everything is okay. It's just a text overlay. So what we did, um, my friend who's got a better oscilloscope than I've got, uh, this Rigol only has X and Y uh, inputs on it. And really, in order to replicate what's on this screen, we need the X, Y and the Z uh, access um, outputs from this instrument fed to another oscilloscope and when you invert the video etc then you can see the image that will be on the CRT on the oscilloscope screen you see and so that will tell us whether or not there's a problem with the CRT driver board which is this board here in the back uh, that one or it was a fault before there so we wanted to rule out a CRT issue or a CRT driver issue. Obviously if we're getting the spectrum analyzer nice and crisp as we are and the oscilloscope nice and crisp which we are, it can't be a fault with the CRT because if it was then it would be prevalent on all images that it's displaying and it isn't. It's only where it needs to display text information. Now in order to generate the uh, the signal, um, the the instrument uses a, a character generator now the character generator um, if I can get this damn thing to focus the character generator um, generates characters that are displayed by displaying dots basically luminance dots and they're outputted from this digital board, as you can see there, in a particular uh, pulse width. And we've got an X uh, and a Y axis, uh, which is uh, obviously just these two here. Horizontal and vertical, X and Y, and Z axis, which is obviously uh, a Z sweep, which is here. Like this, so we have three signal outputs. And if we couple those outputs then to a to an oscilloscope, like that Rigol, for example, that we can't in this case, because that only has X and Y uh, inputs on it, not a Z, then we can replicate what should be seen on the CRT. Now, um, we did that off camera. I got my friend to bring up a better oscilloscope than I have, an Itachi one, and um, it has a Z input, a Z axis input on it. So we did actually connect up the oscilloscope to those um, points. Now, what it was, uh, we, we didn't realise that we weren't getting any video information from those points because they're not actually being scanned horizontally or vertically at that point. Uh, basically, all that's happening there is, is that um, it's presenting luminance information uh, of where a dot would appear on the screen. So it's it's all in relation to timing and the timing comes from the scope board horizontal and vertical sync generators which are after this section that I'm showing you now so we didn't get any video information there on those three points but what we did do is we we went to the uh, scope board and we, uh, we actually um, on the oscilloscope board there's a character generators and sync generators on the oscilloscope board um, and we've got there the character sync and vertical sync and then the z-axis and they're on test points uh, on this particular instrument um, these test points here and uh, and just at the back just off the edge of the the board and basically that um, is what the X, Y and Z axis would be that's displayed here on the on the CRT. So we've fed those outputs off to an oscilloscope. We then selected the text display on here on the duplex test or whatever 
Um, and what we saw on the oscilloscope was exactly as we see it here. It was very bad, very grainy, lots of lines in it and corruptions. Um, so it looks as if, as if the video actually uh, sync generators, the horizontal and video sync generators are actually at fault because um, without the um, synchronization being correct then the video is inverse like for example here the screen's all green because the text generator is outputting character information of where it wants to see text and, and characters and because it's not scanning properly and there's lots of lines in it which is not very clear to see on the camera but in naked eye there's lots of lines ingrained in it and it's not scanning right we've got this tear off here as well it means that it's not locked the picture in essence it's out of sync and so the video is inverse instead of being a black screen with green text it's actually a green screen with black text when it appears from cold uh, and it's very faint it's as if the video game has been wound right down so I'm confident that it's not the CRT tube itself that's defective or it doesn't appear to be um, there's always a possibility it's using a separate gun for the text as it is for the other displays but according to the service manual information it's not using using that uh, but again we've got the character generator here on the logic board um, which, is, which is just there and then we've got that's how it works so basically it's in memory in a read-only memory there's a latch and a shift register and then it outputs the luminance information then um, as x y or z axis information and the axis information is passed on then to the scope board the scope board is part of the oscilloscope section for displaying all modes and basically what it does it utilizes a horizontal vertical and z axis sync generators on the scope board to time the character information that's coming from the digital board and as I say what it does it multiplexes uh, does a scope board these inputs so for example if you're on the spectrum analyzer for example it takes the video input feed the raw video that's coming from the spectrum analyzer module which is this information here but then it combines it with multiplexed character information at the top which in this case will display frequencies and marker information well that text information obviously originates from the logic board at the far end and it's passed to the scope board synchronized and then it's it's displayed there and it's the same with all the other screens as well that are on here they're all uh, multiplexed as well with various video inputs now we thought that uh, by taking the x y and z axis information and passing it to an oscilloscope to display it there it would reveal whether or not it was a CRT driver board which it still could be because the test points themselves are actually on the CRT board there um, so that board is obviously you know if it is faulty it would obviously you know it's the only place where we've got the video output that we can tap into um, so potentially it could still be that board the CRT driver board but it could also be the scope board now unfortunately there aren't any test points on the scope board to take the x y and z axis information from um, and yet again you know on the outputs of the um, scope board go to de de designated test points on the CRT driver board which we did look at we did connect to those and we still got the same pictures so it's unclear at this stage really um, whether or not it's a scope board that's at fault, the CRT driver board or it could also be the digital board as well the character generator itself is not producing the right character information but uh, we're sort of confident that yeah the text is there because what I can't show you on camera unfortunately is when you turn it on from cold um, you can see the text through the camera quite clearly for a few seconds and then as the tube warms up then uh, the video luminance information comes through more and then the the text is uh, disappears sort of behind this green bar or green screen etc so it's very difficult to demonstrate it on this repair video but i don't have the extenders you see that plug into the circuit bars i was told by an american friend who uh, was talking to me the other day that these test sets used to come with the extender cards for maintenance in them and then there was a little designated slot and you just pulled out the extender card 
and then motor all the thought of that then you could pull out a board extend it raises the board up higher so it's sort of you know at this level and then you can do fault finding adjustments and make all your your measurements there but I haven't got those extender cards and so this is where the problem is um, but anyway I've got a friend another guy who's uh, got one of these that's got this power supply issue on I'm gonna ask if we can borrow that so we can do a repair for him as well as take the boards out of that and get it down to board level once I've got it down to board level then I can then perhaps do IC tests uh, look at individual components on that board I mean obviously the amount of time I spent on this is phenomenal already I mean don't forget when this test set first came nothing worked on it it was totally and utterly locked up uh, none of the functions worked. none of the switches controls it just screamed the tone out at you there was all sorts of problems with it there's thousands of uh, through hole dry, uh, through hole joints on these boards when I had it all up and I spent tens and tens of hours soldering continuously these circuit boards and as you've seen, seen earlier in the video we had intermittent faults on the boards where you flex them and the through hole joints uh, make and break and then all dry joints on the circuit board and that causes faults and the come and go etc so we've come a very long way considering we've got the oscilloscope working, the spectrum analyzer working, I've also checked the RF gen, the audio gen, uh, everything seems to be working RF wise as well as with the scope. Um, it's just the text info, that's the only thing that's that's left now to sort out. Uh, the potentiometers at the back there, which are those, these three here, uh, those three, they set up the character uh, information, height, width, um, info and they don't work at all so I'm fairly confident that we have got a, a, a character video information problem which could be on any of these boards but I just can't track it down and I've resolded every IC every component and all those circuit boards as well because there the, were dry joints everywhere there were hundreds and hundreds of through hole joints on every circuit board and they're all dry dry you know need resoldering so I'm confident now it's not a dry joint issue anyway that's causing this problem it's more to do with the character generator synchronization um, which isn't working with horizontal and vertical and z-axis sync gens um, we weren't able to replicate a good image on the oscilloscope so that proves that it's not the CRT so I've sort of hit the buffers at the moment uh, we're going to have to put it to one side now and um, we'll wait now for the replacement test set to come that's going to be the service spare and we'll um, do some board swaps and get it down to board level from there I can look at individual ICs, test various components um, and have a look and see whether we can get it down to a component level repair once we know what board it's on but at the moment I'm scratching my head because it could be on any of three boards and even the diagrams and technical information aren't exactly 100% clear on uh, fault finding to that level on the character generator side of things it's not very well informed with that respect so I think I'll have to leave a video here at this stage obviously when we get the replacement test set the service spare then we can then carry the video on and I'll, I'll then do the update section to this video with the actual physical fault what it was and what component were repaired and replaced and obviously then it will update the video but I thought I'd just give you a taster not all repairs go to plan I mean uh, we saw that with the other videos I did on the HP 8920 uh, and in the end I had to give up with that the power supply on that had, uh, well it was absolutely shot we got it working but only to a certain extent so I ended up getting another power supply for that Sometimes you just have to give up with things, you know, or uh, put them to one side for a long time until you get your thoughts together or you get service spares or replacement boards or modules, things like that to try and, you know, pin the fault down further. Uh, but I would like to get this test set working for my friend, you know, it's a very uh, nice instrument for him and uh, if we can get the text working for him so that at least he can see what's on this on the screen then that would be great for him and it would be great for me as well to get another repair under my belt that's uh, been completed in its full extent but sometimes with fault finding on uh, any type of equipment doesn't matter whether it's vehicles, it's electrical test equipment electronics equipment, um, hydraulic equipment, whatever it could be when you've got a machine, an instrument, a piece of equipment for repair 
sometimes you can't fix it all in one go sometimes you get nearly there 99.9% .9 there and there's just that last little bit of a stumbling block where we need to have another piece of equipment in order to allow us then to complete the repair or we we need another spare circuit board or something like that in order to just pin it down to one particular board and then we can sort of then complete that last step so with that I'll leave the video here at least you've seen the repair video so far uh, we've always been able to um, show the repair step by step in all the videos that I do and we can at least now see that the um, spectrum analyzer works lovely all the other functions work fine as well so I'm quite happy what I've done so far at least you know we, we are a massive improvement on where we, we started off and um, hopefully it gives somebody else the confidence to just get stuck in and try and you know battle through all the technical information the diagrams the fear of operation and then to try and fault find to board levels some instruments are easier to work on than others um, in the case of Motorola I've found this a more difficult task set to work on because of the way it's designed internally and the boards and everything and it relies on the service manual and all the service information relies on you having those extenders to plug in whereas with IFR, Marconi, Aeroflex, HP Agilent things a little bit more easier to do with them uh, Rod and Swartz um, you know and, and what have you and Schlumberger and other test sets that I've repaired are a little bit easier to uh, to understand and to bottom out some of the faults on and, and the way they're designed they're designed to be repaired as well whereas I think the Motorola is designed to be repaired but you must have meet certain prerequisites which is obviously to have the extender cards that plug in if you haven't got them you're screwed so basically that's where I am I'm well and truly screwed at the moment until I can get a a nice uh, replacement test set that's got working boards in it that I can swap out and uh, and get it down to that level so yeah a bit of disappointment at the moment but I'm sure we'll we'll get it fixed in the end and we'll, we'll update you accordingly so um, we'll hand you over now back to um, the last part of the video and uh, we'll leave it here at this uh, moment and then we'll be able to add on at the end of this what we actually did to fix it when I get the service spare so thank you for watching and um, see you again. Bye bye. We've got the uh, EHT supply apart now, uh, which consists of this transformer with all the parts on it. Um, I've been testing continuity basically between all these wire ends and the um, CRT tube socket. Now the cathode ray tube um, has obviously got a six volt eater the uh, gun supplies and then obviously the the guns themselves are driven from the um, video board uh, which has got a separate socket this red connector is the video drive now we've got a basically a Jacobs ladder multiplier here that's buried under this epoxy um, we've got I think the heater wires are these two here so I'm going to measure those although I've measured them from sort of the continuity here to the socket i'm going to measure the resistance of the coil to make sure the heater coils are okay this wire snapped off so i've had to pull that back i think that's with me getting this board in and out a few times and i think that's snapped off it goes down to number four down there that little lamb there where my fingernail is now i've had this transistor out because i'm clutching at the straws now i'm, I'm down to either the opto couplers or these driver transistors that drive the focus and uh, intensity control so I've had this transistor out and tested it already on the uh, transistor tester and I'm uh, that's tested okay. I'm just about to take this one out and then the optocoupler. This is a, a dual channel optocoupler so there's one output for this transistor and the other output for that transistor down there. Now I'll show you the diagram shortly but basically uh, these control the focus and intensity and um, I notice when the board's in and it uh, powers up with the um, CRT powered up. Obviously, when you're working on things like this, you've got to be really careful. I mean, you know, you're talking, uh, you know, tens of thousands of volts present on the on the anode cap on the um, CRT. So you've got to discharge that down there um, where the anode 
anode cap connects and, and obviously the same this board's charged up as well if you've uh, if you've run it so you've got to be really careful and the EHT output is this black wire here which goes up to a, a, a little red cap which goes on the the outside of the CRT up there so you've got to discharge that and you've also got to discharge the tube um, be very careful when disconnecting the plug at the back because the CRT uh, nipple for the glass tube is just down there and if you nick that then that's it you can discharge the tube vacuum so blow the tube up so you've got to be really careful that you don't pop the tube very gentle plug um, pushing the plug on and taking it off and uh, which is this thing here which goes on the back of the CRT although we did find that the transistors themselves the power transistors the three of them two of them are the switches for this transformer and the other one is a regulator IC um, now they were in the wrong order on this board but it didn't matter because when they were in the correct order uh, whoever had tried to repair this before had not put the transistors back in the right order but because all three of them are NPNs and they're all similar voltage working and current handling, two are 2N5881s and the others are 2N3055. So even though they're in the wrong order, it didn't make any difference because uh, they're all NPN and they're all still working and switching. So we're, we're sort of down to, um, I think, the, the focus controls because when the replacement power supply is in, which I've got a test one, that works fine with the control uh, for focus and intensity when this board's in the original it doesn't uh, the focus and intensity doesn't work at all so these two transistors control that so i'll desolder that and this chip and then we can uh, we can take it further then and start testing other components and and such like but yeah very interesting um but testing these wires continuity wires to the socket and then making sure all the uh, all the connections from the the supplier there, and um, that way then at least we know the wiring's okay. Bear in mind it's a common fault that the wires break. Okay, we've uh, tested all the uh, ICs there. Okay, uh, the two driver transistors with a green top on for the focus and um, brightness controls, which are these two transistors. So the two big transistors here and here, we've tested those, the one with the green top on, these two we've tested which drive these two, the IC that sits here, this one up amp, we've tested that, um, what else, I've tested all the diodes on the board as well, um, the only thing I haven't tested yet are the opto couplers which are these two black uh, square things here. They need to be tested, but everything else looks okay. So it could be that it was just that wire it might have broken off and been held down there by the insulation or something has held it in. I don't know. I'm clutching at the straws again with that one. But I'm going to test these capacitors next. Uh, I'm going to put the chip back in and uh, reassemble it all and test it again. See if it works after that. Okay, we've uh, tested all the uh, ICs there, okay, uh, the two driver transistors with a green top on for the focus and um, brightness controls, which are these two transistors. So the two big transistors here and here, we've tested those, the one with the green top on, these two we've tested, which drive these two, the IC that sits here, this one up amp, we've tested that. Um, what else? I've tested all the diodes on the board as well. Um, the only thing I haven't tested yet are the opto couplers, which are these two black uh, square things here. They need to be tested, but everything else looks okay. So it could be that it was just that wire it might have broken off and been held down there by the insulation or something as. Held it in. I don't know. I'm clutching at the straws again with that one. But I'm going to test these capacitors next. Uh, I'm going to put the chip back in and uh, reassemble it all and test it again. See if it works after that. A bit further now on with this. A um, couple of things really. Um, as I said in in the last part, that uh, these transistors and ICs are 
have all been out that green top one down there this transistor uh, they drive the, uh, the the CRT uh, in addition to that I found that these three electrolytic capacitors that were here uh, 100 mic at 25 volts a 10 mic at 25 volts and a 47 mic at uh, 50 volts had um, capacitance was way off so I've replaced those three capacitors uh, the only thing that remains really that I could try and test, although it's a bit caked up in this uh, snot down there, is these are optocouplers, these black square modules. There's one just there under this wire and there. Uh, and likewise, this wire here had broken off the circuit board and it's still a bit flimsy, even though it's single core. It's, I need to put a spot of glue on that just to keep it in place like what this one is down here. But what I've done, I've tested the continuity again of all the wires and where they connect to the, the net connector for the CRT. And what I've also done is the connection on the uh, CRT driver board to the what is the, the neck of the um, connector. I've checked the continuity of cable in between the red plug there and, and here where it mates with these 1K resistors on the board. Um, so the signal goes through the 1K resistor and then it's across these... Um, Zener diodes that clamp it. So I've checked the Zener diodes for shorts, they're all okay. The resistors, none of them have gone high, they're only 1k. And then obviously I've checked the continuity of the wire that leaves the circuit board after the resistor to the pin on the socket. So I'm confident that the video drive that's coming from the board is actually getting to the CRT neck. Um, and likewise, all the wires here that connect to the main board have all been checked to these point these actual pins um the socket itself connections female socket uh from the motherboard right up to there so i know that the wires are fine there's no breakages anywhere it could be that since it was last put back together that wire's just been held in place by the you know the, the loom of wires as this grommet's pushed on further and it may have been off for a while i don't know but uh I've tested all the diodes as well, they've been tested, um, the resistors and things, I've checked those, I've, uh, the only thing that I've not tested um, fully is the optocouplers, so that will be the next thing to do, this is obviously 1984's version of an optocoupler, obviously the modern counterparts of, you know, a quarter the size of this, so I'm wanting to avoid, you know, causing any damage trying to lever them out because of this epoxy resin that the, they're sort of immersed in or one of them is it certainly anyway so and the old adage is if it ain't broke don't fix it so I think in a combination of things really when we're doing the test that I've done for the transistor driver stage the fact that these three capacitors were all off in uh, in value the wire was off here as well which is obviously one of the um, drives i've tested as well the coil these are the heater wires coming out six volt heater and uh, not only have i tested continuity well i've basically gone on where they go connect which is these two black wires here to the heater element which is the darkened area of this um, socket i've tested continuity between these two pins which then test the continuity of the coil in here just to make sure the heater coil is not open circuit but that's fine absolutely fine so basically all the continuity of the wires is correct to the actual pins on the um, CRT neck socket and um, we've obviously replaced a couple of components here now uh, the next stage after this if it doesn't work is for me to test the optocouplers and perhaps replace this IC this um, op amp because I noticed that when I adjust the focus control on the uh, front of the instrument it makes no difference to the uh, to the um, adjustment in the in the brightness now this here is a little bodge I'm not sure if this was done at factory it looks like it potentially could be because the snot that's used here to glue these together is very similar to the glue if not the same as that so I, I'm still and it being genuine Motorola components as well I thought that they may be done in factory the other power supply I've got for test doesn't have this mod and I'm not sure if this is actually causing a fault so I am tempted to remove it because it looks like it's some kind of a, uh, 
a clamp of some description. So we'll assemble it all back together and see how it goes. And uh, we'll see what we can do next. A bit further now on with this. A um, couple of things really. Um, as I said in, in the last part that uh, these transistors and ICs have all been out. That green top one down there and this transistor. Uh, they drive the, uh, the, the, the CRT. Uh, in addition to that... I found that these three electrolytic capacitors that were here, uh, 100 mic at 25 volts, a 10 mic at 25 volts, and a 47 mic at uh, 50 volts, had um, capacitance was way off. So I've replaced those three capacitors. Uh, the only thing that remains really that I could try and test, although it's a bit caked up in this uh, snot down there, is. These are opto-couplers, these black square modules. There's one just there under this wire and there. Uh, and likewise, this wire here had broken off the circuit board. And it is still a bit flimsy, even though it's single core. It's, I need to put a spot of glue on that just to keep it in place like what this one is down here. But what I've done, I've tested the continuity again of all the wires and where they connect to the, the net connector for the CRT. And what I've also done is the connection on the uh, CRT driver board to the what is the, the neck of the um, connector. I've checked the continuity of cable in between the red plug there and, and here where it mates with these 1K resistors on the board. Um, so the signal goes through the 1K resistor and then it's across these um, Zener diodes that clamp it. So I've checked the Zener diodes for shorts, they're all okay. The resistors, none of them have gone high, they're only 1K. And then obviously I've checked the continuity of the wire that leaves the circuit board after the resistor to the pin on the socket. So I'm confident that the video drive that's coming from the board is actually getting to the CRT neck. Um, and likewise, all the wires here that connect to the main board have all been checked to these point, these actual pins, um, the socket itself connections female socket uh, from the motherboard right up to there so I know that the wires are fine there's no breakages anywhere it could be that since it was last put back together that wires just been held in place by the you know the, the loom of wires as this grommets pushed on further and it may have been off for a while I don't know but uh, I've tested all the diodes as well they've been tested um, the resistors and things I've checked those I've uh, the only thing that I've not tested um, fully is the opto couplers so that will be the next thing to do this is obviously 1984's version of an opto coupler obviously the modern counterparts of you know a quarter the size of this so I'm wanting to avoid you know causing any damage trying to lever them out because of this epoxy resin that they're sort of immersed in, or one of them is certainly anyway, so. And the old adage is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So I think in a combination of things, really, when we're doing the test that I've done for the transistor driver stage, the fact that these three capacitors are all off in, uh, in value, the wire was off here as well, which is obviously one of the um, drives. I've tested as well the coil. These are the heater wires coming out, 6-volt heater. And uh, not only have I tested continuity, well, I've basically gone on where they go connect, which is these two black wires here, to the heater element, which is the darkened area of this um, socket. I've tested continuity between these two pins, which then test the continuity of the coil in here to make sure the heater coil is not open circuit. But that's fine, absolutely fine. So basically, all the continuity of the wires is correct. The actual pins on the um, CRT neck socket and um, we've obviously replaced a couple of components here now uh, the next stage after this if it doesn't work is for me to test the opto couplers and perhaps replace this IC this um, op amp because I noticed that when I adjust the focus control on the uh, front of the instrument it makes no difference to the uh, to the um, adjustment in the in the brightness now this here is a little bodge i'm not sure if this was done at factory it looks like it potentially could be because the snot that's used here to glue these together 
is very similar to the glue wheel, if not the same as that. So I, I'm still, and it might have been genuine Motorola components as well, I thought that they may be done in factory. The other power supply I've got for test doesn't have this mod, and I'm not sure if this is actually causing a fault. So I am tempted to remove it, because it looks like it's some kind of a, uh, a clamp of some description. So we'll assemble it all back together and see how it goes, and uh, we'll see what we can do next. So where we're at now is we're taking out from the, the circuit the Zener diodes and uh, there are three or four Zener diodes of different voltages in the intensity modulator circuit on this Motorola test set. Now I've done a, um, a basic ohms check across the, the Zener to make sure it's not short but then what I've done I've set up an experiment here where I've got a power supply supplying 10 volts uh, this is meant to be a, a 4.2 volt zener i think um, so if you just look at the diagram uh, there is a, a zener meant to be uh, up here this 4.5 volt zener uh, in the intensity modulator just here on this line so there's a few Zeners, I think there's uh, three uh, or whatever that we're going to test. Um, there's a 2kV cathode supply, 2000 volts, it's 2000, I think it's uh, 100 volts, 2100 where the cathode is on and then um, 2000 volts when it's off. There we are, look. So it's it's 2 kV, uh, 2.08 kV when the cathode is on, 2 kV, minus 2 kV off. So it's minus 2,000 volts. And um, in order to set that up amongst with the intensity modulator is this 4.5 volt Zener there, VR4. Then there's this 91 volt Zener, VR1 as well. And there are a couple of other Zeners dotted about. There's another one there, VR2, which is 150 volt Zener. So what I've got on the bench here, I've got a, a high voltage um, power supply, uh, which is this Farnell one that goes up to 350 volts DC. Does this, and it's um, a HT supply. Uh, anyway, what I've done, I've cranked it down to about 10 volts DC. And I've got the uh, the uh, a 550 ohm resistor and the 4.2 volts Zener there, and then we've got the um, negative lead connector VAVO connecting to the negative output of the um, zero volt output of the power supply. When we've got the centre probe on the junction between the Zener diode and the resistor, where the 4.2 volts should be. And then the red and the black probes here are supplying 10 volts DC. So if I uh, just switch this on, and uh, then we have a look at the meter here, uh, we've got 4.2 volts DC. So that looks to me like as if it's uh, okay, that Zener. So we've got another another Zener, uh, which we've got here, uh, which we'll, we'll have a look at. This is a 91 volt Zener. Is this one and I think it's a BZ well, let's have a look here it's a, a 1N um, 4763A so we'll see we'll wind this supply up we'll do the same experiment again by soldering the uh, Zener diode in series with the resistor Except we'll crank, crank the voltage up to uh, 100 volts and see whether this uh, 91 volt Zener, which is, um, uh, let's have a look now, the one I removed is this one here, that's that, that uh, 63A. So we're going to check that now, see if that's 91 volts and it holds it at that. Okay, we found a fault now anyway, which is this uh, 91 volt Zener here, uh, VR4. 
uh, one, which is uh, a one N four seven six three A, ninety one volts DC. Uh, what this basically does is it clamps the two kV minus two kV grid and cathode supply voltages, uh, which are derived down here. There's a minus 2.1 kV supply, which is derived from this Jacobs ladder here, this multiplier stage. Uh, this transformer here provides uh, a high voltage output as well for the uh, anode via this uh, circuit, which then goes off to the uh, anode cap on this cathode ray tube. And then this is the uh, grid and cathode supply, which is minus 2.1 kV, 2,100 volts, which then goes up here to the what is the intensity modulator. And uh, then it's, again, we've got another diode there, which I need to test, which is VR2, 150 volts in there. And then it goes out then to the grid. So if it gets 2.0... 8 kV it's on is the grid and if it gets um, again uh, just 2, 2 kV it's off obviously these are minus voltages not positive voltages and um, again this uh, Zener diode here this 91 volt Zener um, is failed and uh, what I've found is that the um, the test that I did earlier before the video this was a 550 ohm resistor, which was in series with the 4.2, uh, 4.3 volts Zener that we tested earlier. And I left that connected uh, up with this Zener diode here, this 91 volt one. And we used the power supply to um, produce 110 volts DC. And obviously on this centre probe we should be getting 91 volts, and we're not. So I'll show you what we're getting. Now we've got a power supply there set to 110 volts uh, DC. And uh, that's what we've got. Now if I switch the uh, power supply on and uh, read what we're getting across that junction, we're getting uh, 6.5 volts DC, which is way off what we should be getting. So this is a 39k resistor, because uh, obviously something was wrong in order for that to burn out a 550 ohm at 91 volts. But anyway, that's um, definitely reading wrong, is that uh, Zener diode. We should be getting 91 volts there, so there's obviously a, a fail there. So we'll, uh, we'll test the other one next. Okay, some more success. Uh, this VR2 here. 150 volt Zener uh, that also uh, is reading incorrectly um, we've got the uh, power supply set up now um, after removing it uh, to 160 volts roughly um, 170 volts DC and uh, we've got the Zener diode um, set up in the same fashion as before, uh, obviously all soldered up and everything, the junction of that resistor, and then we've got the, the probe measuring, you know, what is the difference between them. Now the thing is, is that um, we're not getting any voltage really, uh, when we switch the power supply on, um, the output, the HT output, uh, that's what we're getting uh, on the on the meter. 0.7 of a volt and obviously if I switch the power of the HT off uh, nothing back on of course the other way around we get 168 volts DC if I you know reverse the uh, connections the other way around so that proves that it's uh, it functions but it's not short if you see where I'm coming from because if I if I turn the black and red probes the other way around then I read at 168 volts DC on this center leg so that proves that the diode isn't uh, defective insofar as acting as a diode but um, insofar as regulating the voltage to 150 volts DC um, it's failing to do that so that's two diodes that we've got failed um, 
which I'm going to obviously check any more diodes if there are any in the circuit. I can't see any in this portion of the circuit there. Um, let's have a look. There's just this. That diode's fine. This one, uh, red, that 91 volt Zener, red uh, incorrectly. And uh, then we had. Um, that fail and now this one fails there, the R2, 150 volt. Now I can't see any others uh, other than those three. There's nothing in that part of the circuit there for the focus modulators. Uh, there is a Zener which I'll test as well somewhere down here which is this one. I'm going to test that one as well, may as well while we're at it. And then we're confident that all the Zeners are tested. There is another Zener diode as well that I need to learn about. This here, I'm going to look up this part on the internet and see what that's about. An LCE90 VR5. I'm not sure what that is. It doesn't have a voltage. It might just be a clamp, a transient clamp, rather than uh, Zener. But I'll check it for shorts anyway. But uh, yeah, so it looks like as if uh, VR1... The 91 Zener, Volt Zener, and the 150 Volt Zener are shot. So something's, uh, something nasty's happened there. So uh, hopefully if we can replace those Zeners, then it'll work. I hope that I'm not, um, you know, barking up the wrong tree and that it's actually a, another fault somewhere else that'll keep repeating itself. But I think it may be that those Zeners have just got tired all the time and um, obviously with the voltage that they're dealing with and um, with a minus 2000 volt multiplier there so yeah quite interesting so we'll test VR3 I think it's called now this uh, Zener and see whether that works just reading the alignment procedure for calibrating the transmit power um, mode through the front panel here and it says on the instructions on the uh, alignment procedure that uh, you basically just lift this can up. It doesn't mention anything about stripping the test set down. Just lift this can up on the um, on the RF power board, power meter board, which is under here, and then you can adjust these potentiometers, those little blue potentiometers that you can see just under there. There's two of them. It mentions nothing about stripping the test set down, but as we can see, somebody else has actually been into this test set because the screws capture on the front here even when you undo these screws here that hold the front more or less in place the front doesn't come away because it's held with lots of other chassis rails inside and then somebody's already had a go at that in the corner there um, which again somebody's cut that out you can quite clearly see there we can stop that from strobing a second Let's have a look. See whether we can uh, get it to to focus in, uh, but it's it's um, being cut off just down there. You can probably see just right down there in that corner there. It's been uh, it's been totally trimmed away as a metal because it's been capturing on the on the corners there. Yeah. Again, crap design that. That is a crap design um, by Motorola. Don't know what they were playing at when they designed this test set, but I'll tell you what, I've never come across a test set that's as badly designed as this. Um, so if, you, if you're getting one of these Motorola test sets, be warned, you're in for a real rough ride. So we're going to have to pull this can up in the corner here. We're going to have to lever it up just enough so we can get on those blue potentiometers down there and that's the only way we're going to be able to adjust that board again you know shouldn't be like this you know a company like Motorola shouldn't be making junk you know they should be making good stuff they always make good radio equipment so I don't know why they didn't make good test sets and um, you know it's again a bad design that uh, to have that located where it is it makes it impossible for service engineers to uh, to gain access to to adjust it I mean what a stupid idea is that again you don't get that on Marconi gear IFR Aeroflex or even HP Agilent for that matter 
So I don't know what Motorola were thinking about. Anyway, we'll adjust it and then we'll uh, we'll come back. Okay, we've reached the end of the video now. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. We've carried out all the alignments necessary as per the alignment procedure in the service manual for the RF SIG gen output, the transmit power. Um, we've looked at all the different controls and uh, modes on the test set and checked them through all the ports, the scope, frequency counter, RF input antenna, um, we've adjusted everything as per the manual um, currently I'm listening to an off-air broadcast signal off the, uh, off the antenna and um, everything all functions as it should do you know we're looking at a broadcast signal there from the antenna well, everything's functioning as it should be so again it's it has got some tube burning and the uh, the guns are quite weak um, but other than that it's perfectly readable is the is the monitor um, the brightness of the uh, display only goes so far and then it starts to it starts to bleed out um, but it's a hell of a lot better than it uh, than it started with um, so you know I think it's uh, quite an achievement considering but um, yeah nightmare repair unfortunately due to multiple faults extremely difficult repair based on uh, where we started obviously the fault with the CRT was to do with multiple issues the broken wire um, there was dry joints there was the various component failures in the high voltage power supply at the at the back uh, that provides the cut 4 kV uh, anode supply and as well as the 2 kV cathode and gun supply the minus 2 kV there are two zener diodes that are blown in the uh, power supply so you know what to do if you get that problem where it's just a green screen uh, if it looks like that all the time then it's it's down to those zener diodes um, the other issues that we had were dry joints on all the boards, there were dry joints all over the place, massive amounts of resoldering to be done. Uh, again, somebody else has been in this test set before and caused all sorts of problems with it, as you've seen throughout the video. Um, and it's been quite a challenge as this test set. But I'm very pleased that I managed to repair it, we've got it all working. and. Uh, you know the spectrum analyzer is functioning as well and we can tune that as well to different frequencies and you know we've got quite a bit of uh, progress with it in comparison to where it was and um, everything works fine the sig gen's all being checked with the uh, other radio test set that i've got um, the transmit power's being tested and checked the modulation the deviation uh, on generator as well as duplex and simplex testing so I'm happy to let this uh, this instrument go back to its owner and um, if you do get one of these test sets uh, these in my opinion are more challenging to repair than some of the other radio test sets there's a lot of adjustments that you'll find very difficult to accomplish because without the standoffs for these boards to be um, elevated out the test set so you can get to um, some of these blue potentiometers that are buried deep down in the uh, in that part of the circuit uh, down there you won't be able to adjust them without getting the boards out and I've had a process of having to remove the boards um, to get to these blue potentiometers that you can see there I've had to remove the board make a minor adjustment put the board back in check it pull the board out make a minor adjustment put the board back in and that's the process that you have to go through unfortunately and it's very difficult very time consuming and a nightmare um, so without the standoffs for the board it makes it extremely difficult indeed um, coupled with the the fact that you know we've had numerous faults to deal with I suppose if you bought one of these test sets it would all depend on whether the fault was looked at by somebody else prior. Somebody else has had a go at it, 
then I'd leave them alone. But uh, if you manage to get a test set, or one of your own that fails, um, my advice is to follow the steps that I've shown in the video and um, you should get through it and be patient put it to one side you know work on it bit by bit over time and eventually you uh, you do manage to fan it out and fix it so with that uh, the only other um, caution I can exercise with this is that be very careful with the uh, instrument uh, there's no doubt about it the voltages that are, uh, are present in the instrument quite widely advertised high voltages you're talking you know nearly 5000 volts just for the CRT tube obviously when you're repairing the high voltage power supply be careful with that uh, get an extremely nasty shock off a tube if you disconnect the anode cap make sure that you connect a crop clip to the uh, metal shielding of the uh, tube and then ground the, um, the little contact stud that stands out the the glass cathode ray tube because uh, that acts as a capacitor and stores an immense charge when you disconnect the anode lead as well ground the anode lead to the chassis of the uh, of the unit uh, with a crop clip and the lead onto a screwdriver and uh, be careful at this side of the tube there's minus 2000 volts on this bottom part of the tube the power supply will kill you uh, there's no doubt about it if you get in that power supply while it's on as you've seen in the earlier part of the video, if you don't know what you're doing, it will kill you. Uh, the voltages that are in there are in excess of 400 volts DC, high current. You get your hands across that, you've got half a day with the undertaker. So make sure you, um, you're you very conversant with doing power supply repairs before you go into that. Even with an isolation transform on the bench, it will not save you. That power supply will kill you if you uh, don't know what you're doing so be very careful with that thank you for watching the video and uh, at least we've repaired it we've got it back um, up and running and uh, for a radio test set that was manufactured in 1984 I think it's still an achievement but it's working today in, uh, in such good condition and I'm sure its owner will be more than pleased to see it back um so hope to see you in the next video if you like the video please hit the subscribe button and leave comments below and uh, hope that this video has been educational for those who are looking to repair such an instrument and uh, perhaps gives others confidence in in looking at radio test instruments and um, devices with cathode ray tubes and fault finding in those principles thank you and goodbye